This is Living Catholic with Father Don Wolf. Living Catholic is a fresh look at issues confronting each of us today. This show deals with living Catholic, what that means for Catholics, as well as the impact on the rest of society. You certainly don't have to be Catholic to enjoy this show. And now your host, Father Don Wolf. Welcome, Oklahoma, to Living Catholic. I'm Father Don Wolf, pastor of the Parish of Sacred Heart and rector of the Shrine of Blessed Stanley Rother. In my previous program, I spoke about the proposals from the Belgian participants in the recent synod and their proposal to end clerical celibacy. They want to see the discipline of celibacy for priests come to an end and open the priesthood to married men. In my radio program, I spent some time talking about some of the history of this question and some of the practical aspects of the conversation as well as some of the practical outcomes of such a conversation. But after recording the program, it occurred to me that I didn't really spend any time actually talking about the celibate life that I've led as a priest. One of the faults we fall into when we do talk about this topic is that it tends to become no more than an idea we throw around without it ever really touching ground anywhere. I know when we talk about marriage this way, we're criticized, and rightly so, because what we end up saying may or may not have very much to do with the way people actually live out the marital commitments they've made. So it's the same with celibacy. We use the word, we define its meaning, and then we go on to describe it as if we all know what we're talking about. And in all of this, we seldom actually touch ground. So I want to spend a a little time talking a bit about where this aspect of my life has led me. Partly, this has to do with the way the priesthood is structured here at Oklahoma, because we priests are all celibate men, and partly it has to do with some of the outcomes I've experienced as a result of entering into this way of life and ministry. I guess it's more or something like a practical guide to what I have in mind when I use the word celibate. And by this recollection, um, I hope to present a few vignettes of what it has meant to me in the course of these nearly five decades in which I've lived this life. So I'll begin with a a remark made at a question and answer forum that took place at Christ the King Parish a couple of weeks ago. It was a fundraising event sponsored by Catholic Radio, and the format was dinner, followed by a group of priests who would answer questions posed by the audience. And one of the questions was about married priests. We were asked to give our opinion about what would happen were the church to relax its discipline concerning celibate priests, and several several of us batted the question around a while at the level at it that it was asked at, which was concerning the practical outcomes were there, to be, were there to be married priests in our pastoral positions. But one of the priests there, Father Irwin from St. Joseph's in Norman, took the opportunity to answer the question on a different level than from where the question was posed. He said, I want everybody to know I became a celibate priest by choice. It wasn't something pressed or foisted on me. I entered this life because I wanted to and for no other reason. I liked what he said. And more than that, I liked that he took the moment to say it. It was what had gone wanting in what we had said up to then, which was that this life is something we are given and is for us to embrace, not something pressed down on us from above. It's a discipline, yes, and it has to be accepted in order to be ordained. But we all know we can say yes, even when we don't want to or don't agree. In fact, We do it all the time about any number of things. So it was important for Father Irwin to testify to the truth of his commitment. His yes was an act of freedom, not a grudging affirmation of a prerequisite he was forced to conform to. Knowing other priests on the panel, I know they would have said the same. I'm grateful Father Irwin was awake enough to know that it was necessary to make sure everyone understood there was a foundation holding up the walls. We can talk about changing what the church requires, and we can speculate about what a married clergy might be like for us, and we can do it in such a way that we forget the invitation the church extends to its priest to say yes to a celibate life. We're all invited to embrace this way of living and to do so with an open heart. In fact, to enter into it with less than an open heart is probably not a good setup for a fruitful life. An embittered single life is not what anyone is after in fruitful ministry, a life fully embraced and lived with the conviction that's a a recipe for meaning and joy. Not a guarantee, of course, but there are few of them when we're talking about predicting lives. This was a choice I made when I went to the seminary. 
To be honest, I had no idea what it would entail other than I was being asked to embrace this discipline in order to live out the life of priestly ministry. No one had said much about it when I was applying to go. I suppose the members of the seminary board presumed that this aspect of priestly life wasn't a secret to anyone who would be applying to study for the priesthood. After all, if there's anything anyone knows about Catholic priests is that they don't get married. And while the sum of cultural knowledge has diminished in our day and time, most people do know this, and I certainly did. But as far as what actually it was to entail, I didn't know much. The one exception to all this was when I went to visit the board member, the then pastor at Sacred Heart. He'd been in seminary formation for several years, so he was acquainted with some of the questions seminarians ask concerning the celibate aspect of their lives. So he came to the point with me rather quickly. After asking me about my growing up and what I had been studying in school at OSU, he asked me, so what about celibacy? I stumbled around for a moment and said the regular things about being of service and serving the Lord, and he interrupted. He said, well, when you get to be about my age, you won't think about having a wife, you'll think about having a son. That took me by surprise. At the time, I was 19, and I hadn't spent a second thinking about having children or not having them. I didn't know what to say, so I don't remember saying anything. What could I say? It turns out, probably not much. The guys from college I knew hadn't spent one second talking about having a family or having the progeny that would carry on the family name. Firstly, because they were more focused on their girlfriends than on eventually having a family. And secondly, because they were much more focused on doing well in school and setting up the condition for their future careers than whether there would be any juniors running around their house. As things developed, it was more or less the same when we went to the seminary. Most of the time, our talk of the future in terms of completing our studies or relating to the expectations of the church, we talked about that. We didn't talk about having a family or about not having a family or not having children. I was like most of the men I knew. And to tell the truth, even the guys I knew from college who were getting married as they graduated never spoke out loud about their future families. And it didn't seem as if they had spoken to their fiancés about it either, except in unspecific and broad and, shall I say, vaporous terms. We grew up at a time in which marriage and subsequent families were just not part of the same conversation. So it may be no surprise that we didn't talk very specifically about our celibate commitments until we were much later on in the seminary. But I have to say, when we did, it was a serious conversation. Our rector in the seminary was one of the leaders in seminary formation in the U.S., and he worked to address the spiritual and psychological implications for our choice of living. In fact, he brought in spiritual leaders and senior priests to talk to us about what the life of celibacy would include. In addition, he had married couples come in and talk about their lives together and the challenges of married life. It wasn't so that we'd compare one to the other, but so that we would understand that the challenges of growing into a life of commitment to Christ was parallel for us as celibates as it was for the couples who were married. To make Jesus the Lord of life is to turn our hearts to his will for us. That doesn't change no matter the outlines of our lifestyle. In the end, the ultimate preparation is to embrace the will of God in our lives. The challenge of talking about living a life in Christ is something analogous to the conversation we have with young people about sex education. That is, when it comes to what there is to say to them, all we can communicate is that they have to trust us. We're not really able to explain in all the details what a life of commitment and submission really looks like beyond the fantasies we carry around in our imaginations. And certainly young people aren't equipped to do that. But if we don't try to talk about it, if we just let people stumble into the future on their own, by the time they actually figure out what's going on in their lives, they've become already so enmeshed in their decisions and the consequences of their actions, they're not free enough to enjoy the fruits of a life of true commitment and free choice. So it's the same with whatever outline of our call and commitment will be. Choose to be married or choose the celibate life we have to trust that if we're responding to a call from God, that we'll be blessed in it. In the seminary, we were invited to develop our spiritual lives so that prayer and self-knowledge were a constituent part of our formation. 
This meant that we were probably a little more self-aware when it came to our motivations and our sense of calling than most people our age. This doesn't mean we were superior to others our age. It just meant we'd begun to equip ourselves to live a life without the aid and support of a full-time partner who develops character and choices. At ordination, we all had some idea of what we were facing and of the challenges we were to meet. In my experience, as soon as I got to the seminary from the first day, I knew it was where I belonged. It was exactly the place where I could explore the sense of calling I had received and begin to make sense of what was going on in my life. On the day I began my third year, when I began my study of theology, I knew then, that day, without question, I would be ordained. It was clear to me. This life of calling, it's all a part of what God had in mind for my life. More than anything, I was happy about it. This knowledge gave me real peace. Some men struggle with the decision haunted by the possibilities of what if or should I choose differently. I never had those concerns. From that moment, I knew priesthood was my future, and I was happy to know it would be so. I embraced my future and all it required of me, including living the celibate life. We aren't all that we weren't all that well prepared, I do have to admit. And I mean by that, that there were many aspects of our future lives we weren't ready for. I wouldn't say that we were all that different than a couple who get married and have to lean into learning about their lives together. I was fortunate in that very quickly, I developed good relationships with senior priests here in the diocese who taught me about the beauty and the joy of priestly living, as well as introduced me to the two aspects of celibate living I had not anticipated. These were the gift of good friendship and the great fun that we would have together. I was able to enjoy both. And in this, I was blessed beyond all measure. Several of the men I made friends with at that time accompanied, my, accompanied me in my priesthood the rest of their lives. I was formed by them in just about every way. In this life I have chosen, I found out a couple of things as well. First of all, this life is an invitation into others' lives. Now, I say that knowing that all ministry is an open invitation into others' lives, no matter how the ministry is lived. All ministers are invited into the fragile and vulnerable parts of people's lives, no matter what their marriage status is. So I don't know how to measure my own experience compared to the experience of others. But in my ministry, I'm not constrained by the normal concerns of a spouse and children. This makes my willingness and my opportunity to enter the lives of others a more open possibility than would be otherwise. At least, I found it to be so. There is the chance to know some real intimacy with those with whom I minister. That doesn't sound like much of a substitute for family life or the opportunity to father and raise children. And of course, it's not. But what it is, is different than the normal rhythms of family living, including the limitations and commitment of a family. My life has made me more available and more disposed to others than I could have been were I to be living out my commitment to my family. I found this opportunity to be rewarding in the greatest ways. Life in the parish has become a great network of parishioners and families who have opened their homes and their hearts to me. This has become especially powerful for me since most of the work I have done in the ministry has been with the Spanish-speaking. I've not just been tolerated by those whom I've ministered to in a different language than my own. I have been invited into their families and made a part of their lives and embraced by their openness. And all of that has been a real source of joy for me. Another real aspect of my celibacy has been the places I've gone. And I admit, I've had the good fortune to visit all over the world. Partly this is because I'm interested in seeing the world and experiencing all kinds of places and people. And partly... It is because the priesthood is a gigantic fraternity that opens doors everywhere. I've stayed at convents in India, at rectories in El Salvador, at retreat houses in Mexico City, and at seminaries in Dublin and Newfoundland. I've been in parishes in Argentina, Kazakhstan, Serbia, Singapore, Tonga, South Africa, among many other places. I've had a chance to see the world in more than 70 countries. But more than that, I've been places other people don't get to go. I've been chaplain at four different prisons and have gone into the protective custody pods protecting the criminals who fear other criminals. I've been in nursing homes and hospices and hospital rooms at 2 a.m. and at the state senate as it comes to order. 
The landscapes of my life include the internal dispositions of the most disturbed individuals and the souls of saints, the challenges of the grieving and the joys of new parents, and almost every place in between. I give thanks for all this that it has become available to me because of this calling that I was able to respond to. And there have been a few other aspects of this life as well, especially about finances. Oh, not about how much we make or don't make, but about how we're paid. I know that's also a minor point. As I've said before, we all find a way to pay for what we want. If there were a married clergy tomorrow and we began to make the adjustments necessary to pay pay for a professional position in our parish, enough to sustain a man and his family, then we'd do it. And in a generation, we'd all be wondering what all the fuss of change was about. But we would have to recognize that things would change a lot from how priests make their living now to what would be their living were the arrangements about finances to change. Remember, however much of a surprise it might be, you can't change things without things becoming different. And in this respect, things would become, indeed, different. Because as of now, every priest in the diocese makes the same salary. Whether you're at Mangum or at Christ the King, you make the same pay. The perks might be different, but we're all paid the same. From the day you are ordained to the day you retire, all priests make the same money. There are no premiums for a larger parish or greater responsibilities. There's no advancement from small country missions to large city parishes. Every advancement is purely personal or with regard to responsibility, not with regard to a better deal or a more generous paycheck. That makes the bishop's work of assigning priests somewhat more pacific. I mean by that he's not juggling the needs of a pastor and his family with the levels of salary or opportunities available. Nor is he worrying about demoting a priest and the subsequent impact on his family by going to a lesser position. We're free to go where the bishop judges us needed and not based on the financial resources available. We mostly don't think about it, but it makes us secure. And by that, I mean we're free to do what is necessary in our places and among our responsibilities without worrying about the impact of what we do on our bottom line. I've never thought much about those things because, along with my fellow priests, I've never had to. I'm not worried about whether I'm going to qualify to go up higher or remain the same, whether I can get the next promotion for the good of my family, or whether we'll be stuck in the place where we are now. And for better or worse, I'm not worried about losing my job. Several years ago, in my doctoral program in Chicago, I was talking to one of the other students, a pastor from upstate New York. We were on our four-week residence summer segment of our studies and were living in Chicago. As we chatted and talked about our parishes, he asked me if I had called back home to talk to the folks in the parish or not. I told him no, and I asked, why would I be worried about talking to my parishioners? If there's an emergency, everyone knows how to get a hold of me. And, and they know I've provided for them before I, I provided everything before I left, so I don't have to call back home. Have you called? I asked. Oh, he said, I call back every day. I had a friend, he said, in a neighboring, par- uh, neighboring pastor who was away at a summer workshop. It was for just one week. While he was gone, several of the senior parishioners began to talk about him and about what he hadn't done during his time there. He didn't call back and talk to anyone, so he didn't know about what was being said about him. When he got home, after just being away six days, he found out he was fired, and they had hired a new pastor. So I call home every day, he said, just to see how things are going. I don't imagine this is in any way typical, but it does highlight one of the things I'm not worried about in the life I've been given. How much I might get paid, and how much I might be displaced by someone more acceptable or more malleable, or whose work will be better because it costs more. Those things never enter my mind. I can go through my ministerial life without thinking of such things at all. It's not a factor in my life in any way at all. I don't begrudge different ways of doing things, of course. Those who are married, their families they have families to care for and kids to send to college. Their concerns are real and pressing, without a doubt. But the point is that I don't have those needs pressing on me, and on the parish I serve. What we can learn is not a factor of who who is available to us and where our hearts are directed, and it's not a grave concern for the people in our parish. That makes us all free from this concern. 
beginning in the first century, celibate commitment to the Lord was recommended because it set the stage for freedom in ministry and life. The greatest gift I've been given is the chance to serve the Lord without the, bur the burdens that weigh down so many others. Where I'm called to go and the concourse of my ministry are not defined by these reasonable concerns for family and a spouse. St. Paul recommended it for the fullest service to the Lord. I've found it to be a gift in my own life. In fact, I would recommend it to anyone who has the slightest notion of being called to it. I've been given many families and have helped to form their lives of many young people. Every part of my life has been given to me as a gift from the Lord. I'm grateful I've had the chance to return them to him as a gift as well. Ultimately, this is the life I was called to embrace, and I have embraced it. I couldn't have imagined what my life would be when I first noticed the flickers of this call in my life 49 years ago. But if I could have written the story of my life at that time, with the guarantee that whatever I could have imagined would come to be for me, I couldn't have written of the, riches, the richness and the depth of life I've been given, because I couldn't even have imagined it then. The Lord does not disappoint. Perhaps you might know he won't disappoint you. Back in just a moment. Back to our final segment, Faith in Verse, we have a poem today called The God of the Nations. God sits in judgment of the concourse of nations. Decisions of leaders in their outplay hasten. The divine unfolding of the infinite plan takes into account where the peoples stand. Policies and laws, tradition and war, every part of life together counts and scores. We're not left to ourselves abandoned of the graces of God's goodness has granted. But are the objects of holy concern regarded in all divine favor unearned? But such attention brings God's judgment here. Inescapably, God's measuring draws near. We are required then to look directly, thus be willing to inspect, uh, introspect, and see, and are to be but servants of the divine, always and especially in our time. For we together are the means of grace, as individual souls also keep pace with the rigors of divine commands and laws that demand loyalty from each and all, we the people are to become instruments of the divine's ultimate contentment. That's the God of the nations. As we approach our celebration of Easter, be sure and take the time to contact your local parish or find out from your bulletin about when the Holy Week services will be and when Easter Sunday will be. They are, for all of us, the highlight of, uh, of our liturgical year and what we are preparing for during this Lent. I hope that all of us have a chance to make Easter the highlight of our year. Living Catholic is a production of Oklahoma Catholic Radio. To learn more, visit OKCR.org.